special relativity. Yeah. Well, if you have some difficulty, if I speak too fast or something you don't understand, just raise your hand here. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, well, just uh, as an introduction here, what you see here is a view of the center of our galaxy, yeah, which contains about maybe 200 billion stars. This is right in the center. And uh, this is the distance traveled by the light during one year, one light year. Now, if you zoom, well, the galactic center is about here. This is what you see. Now, this represents 20 light days. So the distance traveled by light during 20 days. And the galactic center is about here. What you see here is not the galactic center, it's a star. Yeah? And what, the most, what was the most amazing is that when people followed up yeah, the positions of all the stars, they found that this star is just making an ellipse, yeah? just turning around something. And uh, I think it is shown here. So the star, which is named S2, is in fact yeah, turning around a fixed point, which is one of the focus of, of an ellipse. Yeah? And from those measurements, you see starting in 1992, here it's 10 years after, you may derive the mass of the object in the center that you don't see. And it's about 2 million solar masses. Yeah? 2 million times the mass of the sun. And there is no doubt, you know, we know today, that there is a black hole in the center of our galaxy. And probably all galaxies yeah, contain in their center a black hole. And well, this is a nice example of an application of the mechanics law yeah, to study yeah, the motion of the stars. Yeah, now, well, this comics yeah, is in French, so just read it. Papa, tu voudrais bien m'expliquer la théorie. Maybe I, I do it in English so that the Indian guys, when they arrive, they will know. So, Dad, would you like to explain to me the special relativity? I understand that the, the time is slowing down when the speed increases. Well, it's because you are changing the time zones. If you fly to the States, well, you, well there, there is a six hours difference. Over a, vol uh, over a flight of eight hours. So if you travel at the velocity of light, you should gain more time because you go faster. Of course, this special relativity theory yeah, only works if you go east. Yeah. Oh, it's not at all what ma'am told me. She's wrong. Well, we, the men, yeah, are much better in abstract reasoning. Yeah, yeah so just show that for all the girls here, yeah. It's not nice. Yeah. OK, special relativity. For us, about uh, the Galilean transformation and the difficulties of the physics, yeah, well, at the end of the 19th century. So here, I just remind you, yeah, what the uh, Galilean transformation is. So this is an inertial system. So one may be, well, connected yeah, with the with the classroom, yeah? And here is another frame of reference traveling with a constant velocity along the x-axis, yeah? So it's a special case. So we will call that, yeah, the special transformation of Galileo. Now, <clears throat> well, how do we do, yeah, in uh, that context to to find the position of an object? Well, it's easy, yeah, with a reference to that inertial system, yeah? We define a vector, r, to the point p. Now, if you are located in this system of reference, well, you just measure the other vector, of course, and then we know, oui, oui, yes, yes, please, just come in, yes. You are a bit late. We are just starting, yeah? Just sit down wherever you find some place, yeah. OK, uh, so well, I just uh, showed you yeah, how to measure the position of an object by means of the two vectors. But now there is a problem of the time. Yeah? So if you are yeah, in this reference system, 
where you may just think about many observers yeah, all along, and each of them have got a clock, yeah, and how to synchronize the clocks. Yeah. What you need, uh, you just use a, a rule, just a very uh, compact rule, and one observer is, for instance, here, the other one is there, very far away. And what you, you do, uh, when you want to set your clock to zero, you take a hammer, you knock yeah, the, the rule, and the other guy feels it instantaneously. Yeah? So you think, well, you assume that your signal may propagate yeah, with an infinity speed. Yeah? yeah, okay? So this is a hypothesis, of course. And when uh, the guy is there, feels yeah, that the, the rule is vibrating, yeah? he's just set his clock to zero. And well, you may synchronize yeah, many clocks in this system of reference. Now, if you are in the other system of reference, which could be a train, yeah, you do the same. Yeah? You use a rule, a hammer, and you synchronize all the watches be between each other. And now, what we know is that, well, we have no difficulty in thinking about synchronization of all these clocks with all those clocks. Yeah? What, for instance, one would do, well, at the time that the train passed at a given point, yeah? well, for instance, oh, well, I, I don't know how to, to call when you, you put a bar on top of a, a letter, yeah? Difficulty for me. Uh, how? A bar? A bar. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Do, do you agree when a, you see a bar, I will see the, it's a well barred, barred O, okay? Okay, this, this guy. So here you have an observer with his clock, and he has got a hammer, and when the train passes yeah, at a given point in the station, yeah, well, with his hammer, he just knock the ground, and the other guy who is on, uh, on the station, yeah, will synchronize his clock, yeah? So we see, well, it should be possible to synchronize all the clocks yeah, of the station with the clocks of the train. Yeah? We have no difficulty. And this is what happens here with the Galilean transformation, is that we may assume that the time yeah, in the moving frame, reference frame of inertia, is equal to the time defined yeah, is the other, in the other one. Well, if you do that, if you measure the times of two different events, yeah, well, an event could be a collision between two particles, even one, and then after, even two, yeah? Someone in the station, yeah, will say, okay, the time, well, the interval between those two events, time interval, is T2 minus T1. Now, in the train, well, the guy will say, well, it's T bar 2 minus T bar 1, but we know that T bar 2 is equal to T2, T bar 1 to T1, so these two time interval will be exactly the same, yeah? Okay, well, the slides are in French, yeah, but there are so many equations that you will have no difficulties, okay? In particular, yeah, if uh, two events are simultaneous with respect to one reference frame, they are simultaneous in the other frame. And you will see in a moment that in special relativity, this is not true anymore. Okay, so if then now <coughs> these are the rel relations, yeah, uh, to make a Galilean transformation. Indeed, we have assumed, yeah. So, well, I'm assuming the following that um, this frame is moving with a uniform velocity v along the x-axis, and that at the time t equals zero, t bar equals zero, o bar coincide with o. Yeah, the two frames are superposed at the time t equal t bar equal zero. <coughs> well, then we see that, okay, the plane x o z is equal to the plane x bar o bar z bar, yeah? The plane x y is equivalent to x bar y bar, so all the planes are equivalent. So we understand that y is equal to y bar, z equal to z bar, yeah? No difficulty, t equal t bar. Now x, yeah? 
the coordinate x of this event is of course equal yeah, to x bar, this coordinates, yeah, plus vt bar, which is the distance traveled by O bar during the time t, or t bar, because t equal t bar. So we see these are the relations yeah, when you adopt the Galilean point of view. Very simple. Now, from these relations, I would like to derive a vectorial representation. And this is easy because you can rewrite this relation in the following form. We may say, OK, the coordinate x, y, z of the vector r are equal to the coordinates x bar, y bar, z bar, plus another ve vector, which is v here, 0, 0. And after I multiply this one by t bar, and so I find that when well, these are just the coordinates of the vector r, which are equal yeah, to the coordinates of r bar defined in that reference system, plus the constant vector velocity times the time t bar. OK? So this is what is shown on this slide here. And if we stick here to this representation, we could say that this is a transformation which just depends on one parameter, which is the module here of the vector v. Now, well, we could think of a well, one reference system and a second one, which could be well, slightly tilted in all the directions. Yeah. And uh, at time t equals 0, for instance, yeah, where the frame, that frame yeah, would have been here. If we do that, yeah, we may just generalize yeah, this relation as follows. So here we also add t equal t bar. So if we want to be more general, we could say, OK, what we need to do here, we just add a constant vector which is yeah, the position occupied, so this is a vector A, by this reference frame at t equal t bar equals 0. Yeah? And here I could say, OK, I just add a constant so that if I'm in New York, yeah, well, I'm just changing yeah, the zero point yeah, of, on my clock. Now, if we look, well, how many parameters yeah, have we introduced? Well, there are many more now. Yeah? Well, here you may get where well, the velocity can be in any direction, so three parameters. This vector, three parameters. Uh, this is already six. Now, uh, B, it's seven. And now the fact that the reference frame, the second reference frame, is tilted in any direction, this may depend on three angles. Yeah? So in total, we find 10 parameters. And this is called the general Galilean transformation, OK? These relations, general Galilean transformation. If this vector is equal to 0, if the time offset is equal to 0, then it's a Galilean, special Galilean transformation, which only depends on one parameter. And one can show, and I'm not going to do that here, that the group of Gal Gal well, that all the Galilean transformations yeah, form a group. This means that, let's assume yeah, that I have a reference frame S bar, which is moving with a, another reference of inertia with a vector, velocity vector V. And if S bar bar is another <coughs> reference system moving with reference to S bar with a velocity V bar, one could show that, wow, well, still, S bar bar is a reference system of inertia moving with reference to S with a velocity V bar bar. And in a moment, we will establish what is the relation between these two vectors. And we know that it will be simply equal V 
plus V bar. And so well, one could show that well, the Galilean transformations yeah, form a group with 10 parameters in the most general case. If it is a special transformation, then it only depends on one parameter. Okay, now what I've done in the lecture note, yeah, notes I have uh, projected these vectors yeah, along the x, y, z and x bar, y bar, z bar axis. Yeah? How to do that? The orthogonal vectors yeah, defined in the first reference systems we are related yeah, to the other orthogonal vectors defined in S bar by this relation where we have a summation on this index. Yeah? So I didn't indicate a summation on J equal 1 to 3, but it is implicit. Yeah? Okay? Now what I do, I multiply uh, this relation by these vectors, and what I find, I find that R times EI would be equal to AIJ times R bar times AG bar plus AIJ times V times AG bar plus AIJ times A times AG bar, like that, yeah? Now, if you do that, yeah, multiplication of R by e EI will give you uh, XI, simply, yeah? The coordinates XI in the first reference system is equal to AIJ times, now R bar times AG bar will be X bar J plus well, I could, can put this in evidence like that, yeah? It will be plus VJ plus AJ like that. It's put a bar like that. And finally, the, the last one remains as it is, T equal T bar plus B. And it, it's here that I find that I have here three parameters, three parameters three parameters, which are the angle, yeah, and now one, so ten. Yes? Sorry, but don't you have to put the time of the VG? Yeah, of course, VG yeah. Bar. Absolutely, so it was... Yes, I think yeah. you've also in the first E, T bar, and here T bar, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so just to show you yeah, why there are ten parameters, yeah, Three for the components of that vector, three for the components of those, that vector too. Three angles yeah, to define the rotation of one frame with respect to the other, and one parameter here, so 10 parameters in total. Okay. Yeah, now about uh, how do the velocity, yeah? compose themselves when you go from one reference frame to another one, yeah? So, I remind you the relation that R is equal to R bar plus VT bar plus eventually such a vector. And we know that when T equal T bar plus V. So, if I define, define the velocity of a particle yeah, in the S reference frame, so the vector velocity is equal to the derivative of R with respect to dt. Yeah. Now, I know if I derive with respect to t, yeah, well, it's equivalent to derive with respect to t bar, yeah, because if I take the differential of that relation on the left side, yeah, the well, differential of B, which is a constant, is zero. Yeah, so I have this. I may rewrite this as follows: is equal to the derivative with respect to T bar of R, which is R bar plus V T bar 
plus A. Now, I distribute yeah, the derivation on these three terms. So dr bar with respect to dt bar, do you agree that it's v bar? Plus, this is a constant vector, but t bar is here. So when I derive this quantity, I just find plus v. And then I derive here a constant vector, yeah, a, which is 0. So what, what I find is a law of the composition of velocities yeah, under Galilean transformations. Simply that v equal v bar plus v. So if, if I am in the train passing in front of a station with a velocity of 100 kilometers per hour, yeah, and I throw a ball yeah, with a velocity of 50 kilometers per hour in the train, the guy at the station yeah, will see the ball yeah, rolling with a velocity of 150 kilometers per hour. Yeah? And this seems yeah, natural to us, yeah? of course. Now, what about the law of the composition of acceleration? Yeah? OK, so we say okay, the acceleration of the particle in the reference frame S is equal to the deri derivation of V with respect to the time t. So this is equal to what? Oh, I have to derive V with respect to t. But this is the same as deriving with respect to t bar. Yeah? When I derive V bar with respect to T bar, I find gamma bar. And now if I derive with respect to T bar a constant vector velocity, I find zero. And so we find that gamma equal gamma bar, yeah, the invariance of acceleration yeah, with respect to the inertial re reference frames. Yeah. So we know that equation yeah, of Newton, yeah, the equation of motion, f equal m gamma will be valid yeah, with respect to any inertial reference frame. Yeah? Okay, this is nice. Now there is um, an experiment yeah, where, which is part of a course of physics yeah, which is a Michelson and Morley experiment and uh, I'm just wondering did you get a description of that experiment during your physics lectures or not at all? Not, not quite, yeah? So what will happen yeah, is that on uh, November 17, yeah, uh, Sarah Costa yeah, will present yeah, during one of the practical uh, work, yeah, which will take place on a Thursday, this experiment. Yeah? And now well, I'm just going to be very brief and tell you what, what it is about. Well, <clears throat> there was a big dispute at the end of the last century whether, yeah, whether there was a, an eater, well, eater in French, it's ether, yeah, yeah, uh, through which yeah, electromagnetic waves were propagating or not. And people thought that this uh, eater, we, we don't know, we, no, nobody said yeah, what it was composed of, yeah? but was, was attached to the Earth. Yeah? So we were a privileged reference frame. And Michelson and Morley wanted to, to demonstrate whether that was right or not. And so they thought about this experiment. They said, okay, this is the sun. And this is the Earth going around the sun. And sometimes the velocity of the Earth goes in the direction, perpendicular in the opposite direction. And they just use yeah, what is known as an interferometer, well, with the reflective parts. They were just shooting a beam of light along the two arms and measuring the time of propagation and return of two beams. And they say, well, if the Earth goes in, the, in that direction, yeah, well, the, the velocity of light should be composed with the velocity of the Earth around the Sun. And you should not see the same result yeah, at this time or at this time. Yeah, because if you do the experiment in that direction, and uh, well, three months later, in that direction, the same direction, you should not see the same effect because once the uh, 
the velocity of the Earth yeah, is in that direction and one's in that one. They did the experiment. And uh, so they, they hoped yeah, to find uh, the composition of velocities that you see here, that V would be here the velocity of the Earth, here the velocity of the light. Yeah? And, well, you should find a difference depending on whether you go in one direction or, on, or another. And uh, what they found, yeah, is that there was no difference, yeah? It was as if, yeah, the ether was traveling with the Earth, yeah? So that we were a privileged system of reference. And uh, this was uh, unacceptable, yeah, to most of physicists, yeah, except with a small fraction. And, uh, well, the guy who is going to solve, yeah, that problem is Einstein, in fact, yeah? Okay, but this experiment yeah, will be presented to you yeah, on, I said, 17th of November. Yeah. Okay, now, <clears throat> already in 1865, yeah, Poincaré said, well, there is a, well, uh, uh, some antipathy, yeah, deep antipathy between uh, the equations of Maxwell and the Galilean transformations that I just brought before. Because if you try yeah, to use the Galilean transformation to write the equations of Maxwell from one system to the other, you see that, whoa, you're getting ugly equations, yeah? Very, very uh, unnatural. So Poincaré yeah, already realized that something uh, strange was going there. And then uh, with respect to the ether, yeah, which was uh, a matter of dispute between the physicists, yeah? You will see um, it is really problematic because uh, I just wrote you have uh, what is known as a light aberration discovered by Bradley in 1725, which is the following. Yeah. So here I just draw a system of reference S in here S bar, another one moving in the direction with the velocity big V. Now, let's assume yeah, that there is some rain. Yeah? It's raining. That S is a classroom and it's raining. This is V. Yeah? This is the velocity of the rain. So what we find is that V bar, the velocity of the rain in that reference frame is equal to V minus the velocity of that system, yeah? So it could be you are moving like that, yeah? On a street, yeah? Or with respect to the classroom. So, okay, let's try to, to see in which direction this goes, yeah? So V is going in that direction. Uh, the big V in that direction, but here I should make plus minus V, yeah? So plus minus V is that. So, the summation of the two vectors is one vector in that direction. So what I see, if the rain is falling down vertically yeah, in the classroom, and I'm traveling, I see the rain going like that. Yeah? And this is what happens yeah, when it's raining. If you have an umbrella, you'd better yeah, put the umbrella in that direction. Otherwise, it would be all wet. Yeah? If you keep it like that, yeah, you will receive yeah, the rain in your face. And uh, Bradley, in uh, 1725, found that the, when you're observing stars, yeah, depending on, when, on, on the position of the Earth with respect to the Sun, and if you're observing a star, it's not in the same position. Yeah? So the direction is slightly changing, just as the rain, due to the velocity of the Earth around the Sun. Yeah? And this is known as a phenomenon of light aberration. And to explain that, well, he, he needed a, an ether, yeah? Yeah? To, to propagate the light. So you see, this is an experiment which is in agreement yeah, with what is observed and assuming that the ether exists. Now probably you, you have uh, seen what, what was the, ether, uh, the Doppler, Doppler Fizeau effect with respect to the light, yeah? So it's a change in frequency or in wavelengths due to the motion of the observer or of the light source. 
And for that, also, you need the ether, yeah? So a substrate through which the light propagates to, to apply that relation, yeah? Okay, but now, in 1851, Fizeau made an experiment, and I'm going to show it to you a bit later. And what he did, yeah? He took a recipient with water, a liquid in it, yeah? And, uh, well, he took a beam of light passing through that recipient, and that recipient was moving with respect to the Earth, and he tried to measure the velocity of light with respect to the Earth, yeah? And what he found, and I'll show you the experiment a bit later, is that it is as if, yeah, the ether was partially, yeah, traveling with the moving recipient. So it's a partial motion of the ether, yeah? After experiment of Michelson and Morley, I, I, I told you that uh, he tried uh, to measure the velocity of light with respect to the ether that he, he thought was probably associated with the sun, but not with the earth. And his experiment showed that, wow, it is as if yeah, the ether was uh, traveling with the Earth, yeah? So you see sometimes uh, where the ether is fixed, sometimes it's uh, partially moving, and sometimes it's completely moving with, uh, with uh, the moving reference frame, yeah? So it was very difficult to understand. In 1893, Fitzgerald and uh, Lawrence, two physicists, yeah, just proposed the following to, to explain all of this, yeah? They said, wow, when uh, an object is traveling with respect to another reference frame, probably its length is getting contracted. Yeah? So this was an explanation uh, to account for all the observations, but many people didn't accept that view, and they were wrong. But and now it's Einstein in 1905 yeah, who proposed yeah, the following and uh, this is amazing. He said, well, if you are on the Earth and moving in any direction, and you make an experiment and measure, try to measure you know, the motion of the Earth with, uh, while uh, trying to compose it you know, with the velocity of light, it doesn't work because the velocity of light is always the same with respect to all the inertial frame of reference. And this is uh, kind of uh, difficult to understand. Now we come to the Lorentz transformation, which is um, the approach followed by Einstein yeah, to account for all the difficulties encountered yeah, during the past century. So he still assumes that uh, one uh, reference system is fixed yeah, here, the other one propagate, well, travels with a constant velocity v. Uh, the x and x bar axis yeah, coincide. And uh, you still measure the position yeah, of uh, an event, for instance, a collision between two particles, yeah, by means of two vectors. Yeah? No problems. Now, wh what Einstein says yeah, is that, well, how do I synchronize the clocks in this reference system? Well, he will do it as follows. Well, if you are an observer yeah, located at O, and you would like to synchronize your clock yeah, with an observer yeah, located here, what you will do, yeah, you will put here a small mirror, like that. Then you will use a source of light. And you have a clock. And you say, OK, when I switch on my flashlight, yeah, well, I mark zero. So the beam goes and comes back. And you measure the time interval yeah, between the emission and reception. Let's assume you find that it is two seconds. Well, you say, OK, the light has traveled yeah, during, well, or has traveled a distance of two second light. Yeah? So it's a two second multiplied by 300,000 kilometers per second. Yeah? Okay. And what you say, OK, we repeat after the experiment. Now, I take my watch here. When I switch on the light, yeah, it indicates zero. 
and I tell the guy who is here, when you receive yeah, the, the beam of light, you mark on your watch one second. Because I know it has taken one second yeah, to go from there to there. Yeah? And use the fact that the velocity of light is a constant. Yeah? Now, you, you know that after one second, well, this watch will also mark one second, and the two clocks will be synchronized between each other. No problem with that. Now, how do you synchronize the uh, clocks yeah, in that uh, reference frame? You do exactly the same. Yeah? So you see, you don't use anymore uh, these rules. Yeah? Because there is no signal propag propagating instantaneously. Yeah? It, it takes some, some time to propagate. Now, one thing one can do is that it's to assume that at the time t equals zero, at the time t bar equals zero, the two systems, O bar and O, coincide. Yeah? So, and I may, I may think of synchronizing, yeah? well, the watch of O and O bar yeah? at the time that the train yeah, is here. Yeah? So I say, okay, this is my assumption. So no problem with that. And so, well, <coughs> as before, I know that because uh, that reference frame is moving along the x-axis, yeah, that the y bar is equal to y, z bar equals z. What about the relation between uh, x bar and x? Yeah? And it is here that, uh, well, Einstein has, has done exactly what we are going to do now. He said, well, the transformation of Galileo yeah, doesn't work. So it was x equal x bar plus vt bar. And then we have t equal t bar. But he said, I'm going to try to change the transformation well, as little as possible to make it more general so that when the light of the train yeah, will become uh, very small with respect to the velocity of light, well, I will find again the Galilean transformation. So I try to set up yeah, new transformation, but which are such that when the velocity of travel of one reference frame with the other, yeah, is more with respect to the light velocity, yeah, I find the Galilean transformation. So what he, he said, well, he said, okay, what I do, I assume that x is equal to a x bar, then this one equals b, and then he does the following, he say plus f x bar plus g, g t bar. And he say, well, these are four constants, which are only function, probably, of the velocity of one reference frame with respect to the other, yeah? but, but not more. And uh, this transformation, yeah, should ensure that when you take uh, two events connected with a light ray, if you measure yeah, uh, the time it takes yeah, to connect these two events in any reference frame, yeah, uh, the velocity of propagation must always be that of the light and equal to C, a constant. So this is his assumption. Now, first thing we are going to do is to look at the history of O bar as a function of the time. So we know that O bar yeah, at the time t equal t bar equals zero is here. And otherwise, as a function of time, is traveling. Yeah. So, what characterizes O bar if you are an observer in that reference system? Yeah, located here. Do you agree that it is x bar equal y bar equal z bar equal zero? Yeah. Now you set x bar equal zero in that relation, and what you find is that x is equal to b t bar n t is equal to g t bar. Now, if you divide one by the other, you find that x over t is equal 
to b over g. Now, if you come back in, in the reference frame S, and if I'm asking you, yeah, what relation yeah, with x, y, z, and t describe the motion of the point O bar, what, what, what would you say? Well, you agree you would say that y equals 0, z equals 0, and x is equal to what? x is equal to what? To what? Velocity yeah? Velocity. It's equal to the velocity v times t. the t, times t. This is a simple relation, yeah? Describing the uniform motion of O bar with respect to O, yeah? So, so I find via this relation that x over t is equal to v. So b over j is equal to v. So this is already one relation, yeah? The problem is that I see here, I have four unknowns. Already I have one relation, so I'm still missing three relations. So I'm going to establish now three more relations, yeah? To do that, I'm going to imagine yeah, that the particle here is moving with respect to s and to s bar, yeah? and to write the relation of its velocity in s with respect to its velocity in s bar. Okay? So how to do that? Okay, this is what we have established now. So one event yeah, is a particle at a given point, x, y, z, t. The second event yeah, is the position of that same particle yeah, after a time interval delta t. So uh, after times delta t, so the even x prime, yeah, e prime, yeah, will be at the time t plus delta t. Yeah, its coordinates will be x plus delta x y plus delta y, z plus delta z, of course. This is in S, in the reference system S. Now, in S bar, well, I will say, OK, at the time t bar plus delta t bar, the coordinates of that particle will not be anymore x bar, y bar, z bar, t bar, but it will be x bar plus delta x bar, y bar plus delta y bar, Etc. Yeah. Now, do we agree that the <coughs> velocity yeah, in S will be defined as follows? I will say, well, it's a limit when delta t goes to zero of delta x over delta t, delta y over delta t, and delta z over delta t. You agree with that? And similarly, yeah, I would say, OK, V bar yeah, is exactly the same when delta T bar goes to 0. And here I will say, OK, it's that, that, and that. Yep. Easy. OK, now I make use of those relations yeah, uh, proposed by Einstein. And I just take the differentiation yeah, of both members. Yeah? So I find delta x equal a delta x bar plus b, b times delta t bar, delta y equal delta y bar, etc. And here delta t equal f times delta x bar plus g delta t bar. And the next, I calculate, for instance, delta x over delta t. Yeah? So delta x over delta t is equal to, so I take delta x from yeah, the top, so it's a times delta x bar plus b times delta t bar divided by delta t. And delta t, I take it from here. So I find f delta x bar plus b delta t bar. Now I divide yeah, the numerator and the denominator yeah, by delta t bar. 
So he finds that this is equal to A times delta X bar divided by delta T bar plus B divided, and then I divide by delta T bar, so it's F delta X bar by delta T bar plus B. Uh, plus G, here it's G. 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 Plus G. Do you agree with that? And now if I take the limit, yeah, the limit of this, when delta t goes to zero, well I find that Vx is equal to A. Now delta t bar goes to zero, so here it will be Vx bar plus B divided by F. Now Vx bar plus G. Okay? And uh, well, this is an important relation that we will use when discussing an experiment a bit later. So I just indicate it here. So we find that Vx equal A Vx bar plus B divided by F Vx bar plus G. Now, well, this is even more easier yeah, to calculate, yeah? And you find uh, the following results, yeah? For Vx and Vy bar, Vz and Vz bar. So these are the relations. Now, just a small parenthesis, yeah? If we would like yeah, to represent yeah, these three relations yeah, in a vectorial form, yeah, how to proceed? So I would write things like that, that dx, vy, vz, are the coordinates yeah, of the vector v, yeah? n will be equal to what? Yeah? Would you agree that I may write the things like that? I would say a minus 1 times vx bar plus normally I have a times vx bar. I put minus 1, so here I put one more. So it is as if, yeah, this were not here. But then I have vy bar, vz bar. Yeah, so let me just write here vy bar, vz bar, this. In here, what should I write? Well, zero, zero. And then here I could still write plus, I still have a b here. So here I write b. And yeah, it's zero, zero. And all of that, yeah, I must divide by this quantity. Fx bar plus j, fx bar plus j, fx bar plus j. And here, you see what, what I do? I say, OK, it's equal to f times, well, vx bar is just v bar projected, yeah, on the unit vector carried by the velocity vector, yeah? And then plus g. Is this okay? Now, so I, I may write here that the vector v is equal to, here I have a minus one times vx bar. But vx bar, as I said, is a projection of v bar on the unit vector v over v plus after I have the vector v bar and after if plus well we could say okay vector b defined by those coordinates and then divided by f v bar times V over V plus G. So this is how yeah, 
you may write yeah, these three equations in the form of a vectorial equation yeah, directly. So we'll just check that it's okay. Okay. Yeah. So you see V equal V bar. We have V bar there, yeah, which is here. Then plus A minus 1 times V bar V over V. Then plus B. Okay, times V bar over V. So here, something is missing, just a vector. And it's correct. So I just show you once yeah, how it's possible to establish. This is a law of the composition of the velocities yeah, in the framework of special relativity. So if you would like yeah, to establish now what is a Bradley nutation phenomenon, taking into account yeah, the relativistic effect, this is the equation you should take where you have replaced A, B, F, G by <coughs> the values that we will establish in a moment. Yeah? Okay, now what we do, uh, what we do, we would like to do something different now. So as I said, we, are, we, we still need three, three equations yeah, to find three values of the constants. So what we do, yeah, we calculate the square of the module of the velocity. So do you agree that this is equal to vx square plus vy square plus vz square? And I take the square yeah, of those quantities from here. So we find that it will be a square times vx square plus b square plus two times a b vx bar plus. <coughs> so now look, I have to take uh, plus vy square plus vz square. Yeah. So. I do the following, here I make minus 1, and here I make plus v x bar square, and plus v y bar square plus v z bar square. And I have to divide all of that by the square of the denominator, which is f p x bar plus j square. Now, why I did this? Yeah? It's because here I see that this is nothing else than the square of the module yeah, of a V bar. Okay. Now, following uh, Einstein, yeah? Einstein says, well, if the velocity of the particle you consider yeah, is C in the reference frame S, yeah? it must be C also in the reference frame is bar. This is the invariance of the light velocity yeah, with respect to any frame of reference of inertia that you consider. So what this relation becomes? Well, it becomes C square is equal to A square minus 1 times Vx plus 2ab vx bar okay. plus b square plus c square yes and all of that should be divided by f here, no, I agree. Fx bar is j squared. Okay? Now, what I do, yeah? I take uh, this factor and uh, put it on the left member. And after I distribute, and what we, we obtain is the following. We obtain that f squared times C square 
times v bar x square plus c square times j square plus 2 f d x bar j c square is equal to this term, yeah? which will be a square minus 1 times b x bar square plus uh, I didn't forget anything, no? So I will put plus b, b square plus c square plus 2 times a b v 2 times a b v x square Do you agree with that? And now you see that I have a relation, yeah, which should be valid, yeah. Uh, wait a moment. I forgot the here is our bars, yeah. Bar, 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 and bar. Okay. And this relation, yeah, should be valid, yeah. Whatever is the value of vx bar, yeah. So it should always be valid, yeah. And in order, yeah, to to get uh, that condition satisfied. What you must write is that the coefficient between Vx bar on one side should be equal to the coefficient in front of the other one. Okay. So, first relation will be, well, if I didn't make a mistake, yeah, f square times c square should be equal to a square minus 1. The second relation is that, well, the in independent terms, yeah, here yeah, should be equal, yeah? So I have c square times g square should be equal to b square plus c square. And finally, the term yeah, in front of vx bar should be equal to that one, yeah? So we should have that f g c square is equal to a times B, right? Okay, so we will just check that we didn't make a mistake so that we don't propagate it yet. Okay, so the relations comes A square minus one equals C square F square. A times B equals C square times FG, okay? And B square plus C square equals C square G square. Okay. Then remember, one relation that we have established before was that b over j is equal to the velocity v. So we have four relations yeah, to extract yeah, four unknown parameters, which are a, b, f, g. So let's try to find what are the values yeah, of those constants. So how to, produce, to proceed? Well, from this relation, yeah, we may re rewrite things like that, that f times c square, so f times c square is equal to a times b over j, over g, yeah? So this is also equal to a times v. Okay, now I'll make use of that relation in that one, yeah? So, do you agree that here I have f times fc square so this is f square c square is equal to a square minus 1 but this is also equal to f times av it's also equal to f times av ok So we should see whether it will help us. No. What I would rather do, yeah, I will extract f from this relation, yeah. So f is equal to a v a times v over c square. This is correct. So this one I don't use. 
and I replace f in that relation. Yeah? So we will have that f square, so it will be a square times v square over c4 times c square is equal to a square minus 1. Minus one because becoming very small. So I see that the square here yeah, disappear with the power 4 here. And I just set a square in parentheses. Hmm. It will be a square multiplied by p square over c square minus 1 equal minus 1. So from here, I find that a square is equal to 1 over 1 minus v square over c square. And that a, well, this is the result, yeah? a is equal to plus or minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus v square over c square. Okay? So now I found the value of a. Well, the value of f then is uh, trivial. I find that f is equal, so f is equal to a times v over c square. So it will be plus or minus v over c square divided by the square root of 1 minus v square over c square. Okay? So I still need to find uh, the value of b or j. Yeah? So this will be the relation here yeah, to use in which we will set that one. Yeah? So we find now that c square times j square so or no maybe I will keep the j square here is equal to b square so b square will be v square times j square so v square times g square plus c square so g square multiplied by c square minus v square is equal to c square. Now I may divide, yeah? Is this correct? So c square g square equal b square v square g square plus c square. So g square times c square minus v square equals c square. You agree with that? Yeah. So let's divide by c square. Yeah. So I find that g square is equal to 1 over 1 minus v square over c square. And finally, that the quantity g is equal to plus or minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus v square over c square. OK, now one more uh, constant, b. Well, b is equal to v times g. So it will be plus or minus v divided by square root of 1 minus v square to c square. So we almost finished, yeah? Now we have the problem with the sign, yeah? Well, whether we should take plus or minus, yeah, in those relations. And to find out, yeah, we need to rewrite, yeah, uh, what were the equation, was the transformation of Galileo, and compare them to these new transformations. So according to Galileo, you remember that x was equal to x, well, x bar, yeah, plus 
v t bar, like that, and we had t equal t bar. Well, following Einstein, yeah, which got yeah, we, who has got a relation yeah, to preserve the invariance of the light velocity. Yeah, this is the main, the main goal of this relation. It was x equal a x bar plus b t bar and t equal f x bar plus g t bar. So let's see. Yeah? Let's take a. So you see that a should tend to one yeah, when the velocity of motion yeah, of one reference frame with the other goes to zero. Where is a? a is here. We see that it may only go to one when v becomes negligible with respect to c if we take the plus sign. Okay? Now we, we, we had seen that the sign of uh, f is the same as the sign of A, okay? So we know that for F, we take also the plus sign. Now what about the sign of B? So we see that B, yeah, should tend to V when the velocity V becomes small with respect to C. So B should tend to V. So we see that B may tend to V when v over c goes to zero, only if we keep the sign plus. And now we see that the sign of g, g is the same as b, as that of b, because of that relation. Yeah? So here also, I only take the sign plus. And we found now yeah, uh, what is known as the Lorentz transformation, but established by Einstein. Yeah? Uh, OK, this is all developments we did on the blackboard. So the equation here yeah, of Lorentz yeah, is the following. Yeah? Now that you find that x is equal to a, so it's a 1 over plus b, which is v times t bar divided by square root of that. y equal y bar is equal z bar, but t, you see, is equal to that. And now, what, what was fantastic yeah, is that uh, Einstein, when establishing these relations, yeah, just found that when you take the Maxwell equations yeah, and make a change of variables from one system of reference to another inertial system, that they remain invariant. Yeah? So the equations of Maxwell remain the same if you apply such a transformation. Yeah? So Einstein was not only able yeah, to account yeah, for the experiment of Michelson and Morley, the invariance of the light velocity, but also for the fact that the equation of Maxwell were invariant under such a transformation. Now, what we know is that the equation of Newton will not be invariant through such a transformation since it is invariant through a Galilean transformation. Yeah? And so what is the problem? Well, the problem of Einstein was to say, well, now, I have to find new laws of dynamics. Yeah? And uh, this will be uh, what we will establish during the fourth lesson yeah, of uh, the course of special relativity. So you see the establishment by uh, Einstein yeah, of the Lorentz transformations yeah, enabled to give an explanation yeah, to the Michelson and Morley ex experiment that you don't need uh, an ether yeah, to account for it but just under the principle of invariance of the light velocity with respect to any inertial frame, yeah, you could explain, well, all the experiment. Well, as an example, yeah, already uh, in 1890, yeah, D'Alembert yeah, established uh, an equation, a kind of elastic equation, to account for the pro propagation of electromagnetic waves. Yeah, and everybody knew that, well, this uh, gives a good account of the light propagation. And if you just make a change of variables yeah, from one system to the other, so you make the change of variables in that equation, equ equation of D'Alembert, you will see that you obtain exactly the same equation in S bar. Yeah? So this is a good exercise. Well, if you want to play a little bit, yeah? 
Okay. So as a summary, the transformation from one system of inertia to another is not any longer you know, the Galilean transformation, yeah, but the Lorentz trans transformation. And uh, well, Lorentz yeah, uh, had established that transformation to first order, I think, uh, in 1897, then to second order uh, was the same uh, transformation established, I think, in the beginning of the 20th century. Then in exactly 1903, Lorentz yeah, established this transformation for the Maxwell equation. So he showed that the Maxwell equations don't change the sh their shape under such a transformation. And this was known as Lorentz transformation. And then Einstein in 1905, not thinking at all about equation of Maxwell, yeah, found that in order to account for the experiment of Michelson, Morley, and others, well, these were the equations. So it was very good. And then Einstein had in his mind yeah, that all the laws of physics yeah, should be the same, not only the laws of mechanics, but also the laws of electromagnetism, etc., under a given transforma transformation. So we knew that, Gal well, under Galilean transformations, the equation of Newton yeah, remains valid, but not the equation of Maxwell. And now Einstein found that the Lorentz transformation let invariant the equation of Maxwell, but not the equation of Newton. So he said, okay, I have to find new equations yeah, to describe the motion of an object yeah, under any, any, any kind of force you may think of. Yeah. Okay, so this is, these are the Lorentz, this is a Lorentz transformation. Now, if, well, th this is a, an exercise for you. I don't do it today. Ooh, once more. But if I'm asking you, could you write yeah, these, well, one, two, three equations in a vect vectorial form? Yeah? Well, I showed you how to do with the velocity. Wow, I go too fast. Once more. Yeah, this is, oh, it skips. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but you should be able yeah, to rewrite those equations yeah, in a vectorial form. Yeah? It's not difficult at all. Okay, now, if I ask you, well, <coughs> what are the inverse relations, yeah, between x bar, y bar, z bar, as a function of x, y, z, t, well, you have four equations with four unknowns, yeah, so it's easy, yeah, to, to find those expressions. Now, a, an easy way to find them, yeah, is the following. You say, okay, if I'm in s bar, yeah, and, well, I, I'm supposed that I'm fixed, yeah, with respect to that uh, reference frame. I see S going away from me with the velocity minus V, yeah? So to find the inverse transformation, a very easy way is to do the following. Everything which is not barred, you bar it, yeah? So you see X, Y, Z, T, you bar it, ta da 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 Everything what is barred, you unbar it. So X bar becomes X, T bar becomes T. And V, you have to change the sign, because this time, yeah, the reference frame S is going away from you, okay? Yeah. In, in the opposite direction. So this is an easy way to find the inverse transformation. What else? Well, these are yeah, the vectorial form yeah, of those equations that you should be able to, do, to, to write down. It's very easy. It's just like what we did for the velocity. Uh, okay, and then one could show yeah, that the Lorentz transformation also form a group with 10 parameters, yeah, just like the Galilean transformation. So this is amazing, yeah, that if you take a S bar bar moving with respect to S bar with the velocity V1 and S bar moving with respect yeah, to S with the velocity V2, you find that S bar bar yeah, is still a reference of inertia moving with S, with respect to S, with a velocity V, which is a complicated, complex combination of the two other velocities. It's not anymore V1 plus V2. Okay. Now, well, if you project those equations, yeah, 
uh, along the axis x, y, z and x bar, y bar, z bar, as we did before, yeah? you just multiply by, you remember, it was e i equal a i j times a g bar. I don't do it here, but you find those equations here and find that there are still 10 parameters. Okay. Now I come back to these relations. Yeah? So you remember, yeah, we, we established that equation previously, vectorial form. Now we have uh, the value of A, B, F, J, yeah, which are those, you know, where we found that, I may rewrite them, yeah, that A is equal to gamma, where gamma is one over this quantity. B is equal to V times gamma. F is equal to V over C square, V over C square times gamma. And G is equal to gamma. So if you replace yeah, the value of the constant A, B, F, G in that relation, what you find is a new law yeah, of composition of the velocities. Yeah? So it's not anymore V equal V bar plus V, yeah, as uh, under Galilean transformation, yeah, but it's this very complicated yeah, relations. And this enables you yeah, to calculate, for instance, the phenomenon of aberration in special relativity, relation in which uh, the module of V is equal to C, the module of V bar is equal to C, yeah? but you have each time yeah, three equations which would, would give you yeah, a change yeah, in the direction yeah, of the rain which is falling down yeah, or of the light which comes from a star. Now, what else? Uh, you could demonstrate, yeah? Well, but I don't do that. It's just an exercise that if you take the square of this velocity, then you take the square of all that. It reduces to this simple expression. And uh, because, well, I didn't tell it, but since you have the square root of one, of my, of one minus v square over c square, this should always be positive, yeah? so v yeah, should always be less than c. So the maximum velocity yeah, that any object may reach yeah, is the velocity of light. Now, what you see in that relation is that since v is smaller than c, well, v, if v is smaller than c in one system of reference, well, it's also smaller in the other system of reference. Yeah? This is just what uh, that relation shows you. Now, I come back here yeah, to this relation, which is very important, and I'm going to use it now. So, I take as uh, the case of the special transformation of Lorentz. So, I assume that S bar yeah, is moving along the x, x bar direction. Yeah? And that at time t equal t bar equal zero, O and O bar coincide. So, how may I rewrite this relation? Well, along one direction, so which is the x direction, I may write that the velocity v is equal to a. Well, a is gamma, yeah? Okay, it's gamma times vx bar, so this I may call it v bar, plus b. b, it's v times gamma, so I say plus v, divided by f, f is gamma, multiplied by v over c square, v over c square plus g, which is gamma, so which is 1. So the gamma cancel, yeah? and if I didn't make any mistake, yeah? probably there is a mistake. I try to see. So we have v equal v bar plus v over 1 plus v bar v. So there is a v bar missing here. So where, do you see where, 
Yeah, because it's f times vx bar, yeah? So here I should add times v bar. So just a summary. I find that the velocity v is equal to v bar <coughs> plus v. So this is the law of composition of the velocities in the special relativity for the case of a special Lorentz transformation, meaning that one reference frame moves with respect to the other along just one axis. Yeah? In this case, the uh, x, x bar axis. Yeah? Now you see here that well, if v bar or v become very small with respect to c, well, we find uh, we, we rec recover the law of composition under Galileo. Yeah? v equal v bar plus v. But normally when those velocities are not negligible, the law of composition of the velocities here yeah, is this one. Okay, now what I show you here is a FISO experiment. Yeah? So the FISO experiment, 1890, yeah, is the following. He takes a recipient, yeah, and uh, there is a liquid in it, and the recipient is moving with a velocity v with respect to the Earth, and he let a beam of light propagating in the liquid. And he designed an experiment to measure the velocity of light with respect to the Earth. So this, this is absolutely experimental, yeah? And what he finds, what he finds will come in a moment. But first, I want to take this relation, yeah? And try to find, uh, under special relativity, what I would get, yeah? So do you agree that I may write here that I try to find a good piece of chalk? So if I ask you what is the velocity v bar, what do you tell me? So it's, it's the velocity of light in the liquid. So how much is it? Yeah, C over N. Yeah. Yeah, C over N. So V bar equals C over N. V is, of course, the velocity yeah, of the recipient. And the V is a light velocity with respect to the Earth. So I may write that V is equal to C over N plus big V divided by 1 plus big V times C over N divided by C square. Yeah? So it will be V divided by C times N. Correct? Yep. Now, if I try to develop yeah, in a series of Taylor, 1 over 1 plus x, where x is very small, do you agree yeah, that you obtain, well, is the value of the function when x is equal to 0, 1, plus x times the der derivation of that quantity, so which is minus 1 over 1 plus x squared, for x equals 0, plus second order terms, yeah? so I find that it is about 1 minus x. you agree? Development in Taylor series. So here I could say, okay, it's a c over n plus v times 1 over 1 plus x. So it will be times 1 minus x, so 1 minus v over c to n. Now I distribute, yeah? so I find that it is C over N after plus V, of course. Now, if I multiply these two, it will be minus V 
over n square. And finally, minus v square over c times n. Is it correct? So c over n plus v, then minus v over n square, and then minus v square over c. Do you agree that, uh, well, this is very, very huge. Well, this is already smaller than, than c. This is also of the order of v. And this is uh, v times v over c. Yeah? So it's a second order term. Yeah? So that, in principle, we may neglect. Yeah? OK, now, if you compare yeah, to what uh, Fizo did, so here I show oops, what we obtained. Oops, it just doesn't matter. So the explanation yeah, of FISO was the following. Yeah? Very funny. He said, uh, well, it is as if yeah, the light is propagating with a velocity c over n with respect to the ether. Yeah, so he was using yeah, so the ether as a medium for propagation, propagating light. So the velocity of light with respect to the ether, he said, was c over n. Then the, la the, the velocity of the ether with respect to the liquid, yeah? he assumed was minus v over n square. So all of this he found experimentally. Yeah? So you see there is a partial motion of the ether with respect to the liquid. And then he said, well, and the speed of the liquid with respect to the earth yeah, is V. So this quantity. So indeed, yeah, this was his explanation. And then if you would like to know what is the velocity of light with respect to the earth, you say, well, is velocity of light, yeah? with respect to the ether, ether with respect to the liquid, liquid to the earth. So you have to sum yeah, these three quantities. So you find that the velocity of light with respect to the earth, according yeah, to the classical uh, Galilean interpretation, was exactly what we found yeah, using the special relativity yeah, to first order. Now, according to Einstein, how do you interpret that experiment? Much more simple. You say, OK. Velocity of light with respect to the liquid is C over N. The velocity of the liquid with respect to the Earth is V. And, well, the velocity of light with respect to the Earth, according to the special relativity, well, is this formula developed to first order? And you see, you don't need the ether anymore. Yeah? So very simple explanation of, the, of that experiment. Also, I told you yeah, of the Michelson-Morley yeah, experiment with invariance of the Maxwell equations. So it was uh, something very important. Now, just a summary. Transformation of Lorentz. Law of the composition of the velocities. And now we, we could wonder, for that special case of special uh, transformation, yeah, how do the acceleration yeah, compose with each other? Well, to do that, yeah, I'm not going to do it, yeah, but you, you would say, okay, yeah, the acceleration of a particle in S bar yeah, would be the derivation of V bar with, with respect to DT bar. Yeah? Then you, 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 you could rewrite this as follows dv bar divided by dt times dt over dt bar. Now you, you need the relation, uh, you would like to derive yeah, v bar with respect to dt. But here we have v as a function of v bar. So you need uh, to find the, the inverse transformation. Yeah? So what you do, just as I said before, everything which is not bar, you bar it. 
everything which you borrowed, you unborrow it. Plus V, you say minus V. Now divide it by 1, minus V, still, times V, because it's bar, I borrow it, divided by C squared. So you, you use that relation, you derive it with respect to the time T. Then you will see that when you derive V with respect to T, gamma is appearing. And what we are going to obtain, I'm just going to pass that now, is, is a complex relation for the acceleration, which is the following. Gamma bar is not equal to gamma, but it's equal to gamma multiplied by something, yeah? Which is quite complex. In any case, any, any time the velocity v or small v becomes small with respect to c, well, I recover, yeah, the Galilean invariance of the acceleration. But whenever those velocities are not negligible, yeah, it's not true anymore that gamma equals gamma bar, yeah? The only thing which remains is that if gamma equals zero, gamma bar equals zero. If gamma bar equals zero, gamma is equal to zero. So invariance of the uniform motion of an object with, with, with respect to a given reference system. Now, well, what I would like to show you, so in general, gamma bar is different from gamma. This I, I just said. What I would like to do with you now is just to establish uh, well, what is known as a time dilation and uh, what is known as a contraction of lengths. Okay, so time dilation. You probably heard about it, yeah? So how do we measure time yeah, in special relativity? You see S bar is moving yeah, with respect to S. And here you have on, in S, yeah, on S, two observer, one here with a clock. The second one here with another clock. Now we know that we may synchronize all the clocks on the ground, yeah? Just with a mirror, as I said, yeah? Well, this observer yeah, would send a beam of light here. There is a mirror, it comes back. Two seconds, so you say, well, you are located to one second light away from me. So when you will receive my flash, well, I indicate zero, but when you receive it, you indicate one. Yeah, because it takes one second. Yeah. So we know how to synchronize the clocks. Well, here, you're just sitting in O bar yeah, with your, your clock, and you look at it. Yeah. Here, there will be two events. Yeah? The first event will be when S bar is in front of H1, and the second event will be when H bar is in front of H2. Yeah? So these are the two events. And uh, of course, yeah. On this reference system, S, you need two distant observers yeah, to locate those two events. Rather than the guy here in S bar, is sitting on O bar and will be at the same place in S bar for the two events, and he will measure the time on his watch. And any time you measure two times yeah, on the same clock, same watch, yeah, this corresponds to what is known as a well, proper time, yeah, proper time. If two observers measure the time on two different clocks, they will measure a time interval, but which is not the proper time because it's not the same clock, okay? So this is how uh, Einstein defines proper time and uh, time which is not proper. Uh, yeah, I use this one. So what, what can I write from the Lorentz transformation? What kind of relation between these two events? So I start yeah, from these two relations that you see here. Yeah. So I may, I may write that delta x is equal to delta x bar plus V times delta T bar times gamma. Delta X yeah, between uh, the difference between the two events. Yeah? So it will be this X minus this one. Delta X bar, what will be delta X bar? The value of delta X bar between the two events. So one happens here and one happens there. So if you're in S bar, what is uh, 
difference between the two coordinates in x bar? Uh, t. Hmm? Uh, t, t. No. So, well, I, I'm the observer yeah, in x bar. So I'm sitting on the O bar, yeah? and O bar travels with me. Yeah? So how much is delta x bar? Zero. It's zero. Yeah, you agree? Because you are just sitting on, on O bar here. You are not moving with respect to S bar. Yeah? So delta x bar will be zero. Now the second relation, I may write that delta t equal v over c square times delta x bar plus delta t bar times gamma. So as we said, yeah, what characterizes these two events yeah, is the fact that delta x bar is equal to zero because there are the two events happen at the same spot yeah, in S bar. So this relation becomes delta x equal v times delta t bar times gamma. And from the second one, I find that delta t is equal to delta t bar times gamma. So finally, I find that delta t equal delta t bar divided by the square root of 1 minus v square over c square. And this relation yeah, is known as a relation accounting for the dilatation of time, time dilatation. Indeed, delta t bar yeah, corresponds to a proper time that a single observer measures on a single watch. Yeah? So you measure it, and you find that the time measured yeah, by these two observers on their watch yeah, is being dilated. Yeah? And this is due yeah, to to the assumption that the propagation of light is invariant in S and in S bar. Yeah? So it's really an assumption. And uh, it gives you a theory, and then you may confront it yeah, to different experiments. And you see that you may account for all the experiments. Yeah? So it's not, let's say, uh, easy to accept it. Yeah? But it's a, such a simple assumption which makes a nice theory, which comes for all the physics experiments. So this is known as the dilatation of time. Now, <clears throat> there is a nice illustration of that uh, problem. I'll, I'll come in a, in a moment. Now, could I, if I ask you, yeah, what does this second relation gives you? Yeah? Delta x equals v times delta t bar times gamma. We may still simplify it. Yeah? One reference frame has moved, has moved with respect to the other by uh, length delta x during a time interval delta t. Just of motion of the second reference frame s bar with respect to s, time, the time elapses between the two events. And this is natural. Yeah? It's just like before when I asked yeah, what was the relation between uh, x yeah? of O bar, you said, well, it's x equal v times t. Here it's exactly the same, delta x equal v times delta t. Yeah? So this relation yeah, just accounts for the fact that one reference frame has moved, has moved with respect to the other by uh, length delta x during a time interval delta t, just what we, had, we were expecting. So nothing special here, but this is very special, yeah? time dilatation. Now there is a there is a well yeah I show you here let's assume yeah that uh, s bar is moving yeah with a velocity which is a square root of three divided by four times the speed of velocity this is a very high velocity yeah let's assume that when at time t equals zero t bar equals zero o bar coincides with o and now we are 
yeah, synchronizing the, the clocks. So this one is synchronized with that one, and this one also with that one. Now let's assume that that watch, that clock yeah, has reached this point, and you see now it indicates yeah, 15 minutes. Yeah, 15 minutes. Now, what is the time indicated on that watch and also on that one because they are synchronized? Well, it's just this relation, yeah? So delta t equals 15 minutes divided by the square root of 1 minus square root of 3 fourths at the power 2. It will be minus 3 fourths. So this will be 15 divided by the square root of uh, 4, 4, 1, 4, and the square root, it will be 1 over 2. So it will be equal 30 minutes. This is time dilatation. And you see, this shows you that it's not possible to synchronize, in fact, yeah, at all the time, the watches in S bar with the watches in S. Yeah, this is a good demonstration. Yeah? That is, you see, they are synchronized here at the beginning. They are any longer synchronized yeah, at another time yeah, because the uh, velocity yeah, of motion is uh, quite significant. Now, there is a nice experiment yeah, uh, which is known, which is the fact that uh, whenever cosmic particles yeah, hit atoms in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, there may be productions of muons. And the muons are known to have a lifetime, so it's a proper time, yeah, of only two millionths of a second, yeah, so very short lifetime. And still we may observe them, yeah, at the surface of the Earth. But we know that they are produced probably at a few tens of kilometers far away from us. Yeah. Now, if you multiply two times 10 to the minus 6 second by the velocity of light, yeah? 300,000 kilometers per second, yeah? you find that it may have pro propagated yeah? a distance of about 600 meters. Okay? So how is it possible that you observe them here on the ground while they are produced at a distance of a few tens of kilometers? Yeah? The reason is time dilatation. Yeah? Well, we know that the propagation of the muons yeah, is uh, very near to the speed of light. Yeah? So when you calculate yeah, the square root of 1 minus v square over c square, you find a factor 10 to the minus 2. So to find yeah, the time measured on Earth, you must use the relation of dilatation of time. Multiply 2 times 10 to the minus 6 by 100. Then you find 2 times 10 to the minus 4. And now, during that time, if you multiply that time interval by the light velocity, 300,000 kilometers per second, you find 60 kilometers. Yeah? So the muons yeah, has traveled 60 kilometers yeah, from its location where it has been produced during its lifetime. Yeah? And you see how it's possible to account for those observations. Okay, now, uh, maybe I still have time to show you very, very fast, yeah, contraction of lengths. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Contraction of lengths. So just assume, yeah, that there is a high velocity train. So symbolized, yeah, by this. So this is the beginning, the end of the train. Moving, yeah, with a very high velocity. And here you have the, the ground. So this is a S, this is a reference system S. This is a reference system S bar. Now, if I'm an observer here, yeah, what I do, yeah, well, I can measure yeah, the length of the train because what I would do, I put here a mirror. I have a watch. Where I'm, with which I measure uh, proper time, I just open my light, the flash goes and comes back, I measure two seconds, so I know that the length of the train is one second light, yeah? or one light second. Yeah? 
Now, how do you do? How do you do on the station to measure the length of the train? Yeah? Would you agree with me that what you do, yeah? Well, you post yeah, many, many people all around, yeah? All. And they all have a watch. Yeah, watch. And all those watches, the clocks, are synchronized. Yeah? And do you agree that the way you would measure the time on the station yeah, is the following? You tell, well, maybe at uh, 1 o'clock, when the we know the train will pass, yeah? each of you look where the train is. And the one yeah, who sees the beginning of the train tells me and make measurement x1. And the other one, at the same time, at the same time, yeah, measure the end. Well, this is the beginning, and this is the end of the train, x2. So you measure delta x, yeah, but simultaneously. Simultaneously means that delta t is equal to 0 in this case. OK? Now we start again with our equations there. So I take another color because this one is not good. So we find that delta x, oh, this one, not either, it's all wet. So delta x is equal to delta x bar plus gamma. Uh, is it gamma or V? No, it's V. V delta T bar times gamma. And delta T is equal to V over C square times delta X bar plus delta T bar times gamma. You agree, eh? So now we know that delta t is equal to 0. So this is equal to 0, which means that delta x bar times v over c square is equal to minus delta t bar. And now I just inject delta t bar in that relation, and I find that delta x is equal to delta x bar plus v times delta t bar. So it will be minus v over c square times delta x bar. So I find that it is equal to delta x bar and times gamma. I forget the gamma. Times gamma. It's equal to delta x bar times gamma multiplied by 1 minus v square over c square. But gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus b square to c square. So at the end, this will be equal to delta x bar divided by square root of 1 minus v square c square. Correct? Or not? No. Sorry, it's the opposite. So what we find yeah, is that the length of the train, you know, the high velocity train, measured by the two observers on the ground, yeah, is contracted yeah, by the factor square root of 1 minus v square over c square. Yeah. So if the high velocity train yeah, passes with a velocity being a three quarter of the velocity of light, you would find a contraction of its length by a factor of 100. And this is surprising. Yeah? OK, now I come back to the experiment of the muons in the atmosphere. Yeah? So the muons, I said, uh, had a lifetime yeah, of 2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. And how can I explain the fact that they are observed on the ground? Yeah? So here is a way yeah, to solve the problem, the following. Well, you sit here yeah, on the muon, okay, and you, you go in the direction of the Earth. So, in your reference system, what you see, the Earth approaching to you with a velocity of 0, 0.999995 times the velocity of light, yeah, okay? 
And what you see is that the depth of the atmosphere yeah, is contracted by a factor by a factor 100. So if the distance yeah, on the ground is 60 kilometers, a contraction by a factor 100 gives you well, a length of 600 meters. And we know that well, during that time interval, which is a, a proper time in the frame of the muon, you may travel at, the, at that velocity a distance of about 600 meters. So you see, well, all the experiments yeah, in physics uh, which makes use of either high velocity particles or, or the light may be accounted for by uh, the transformation of Lorentz yeah, established by Einstein. Yeah. And well, in 1905, when he established those relations, yeah, many physicists like Poincaré, well, he already almost had yeah, those relations established. So, well, Einstein was the first, and uh, therefore, <laughs> It's famous. So, any question? Easy or not easy? <laughs> okay, so we stop here. <laughs>